The small business journey can be like a Greek tragedy. Uh, often the business owner is the cause of their own undoing. It can, of course, uh, the small business journey can be uh, uh, a, a, a triumphic epic, uh, or it can be Shakespearean. To be an entrepreneur or not to be an entrepreneur, that is the question. Whether it's nobler in the mind to aspire to the corner office of a government or corporate job, uh, or to be your own boss, uh, to suffer the slings and arrows of pandemics and pointless red tape, and perhaps, just perhaps, to make an outrageous fortune. Uh, you are, of course, live with Lunch Money. We are the online and social media home for special situations, workouts and capital raising professionals. My name is Nick Samios. Uh, I am the director and fund manager here at Hermes Capital and uh, I am your live stream host. So uh, a very warm welcome to you and thank you for joining us. Uh, today we have a very special guest. Our guest is uh, Angela Vithoukas. Uh, and I'll, I'm going to, without further ado, introduce Angela right now. G'day, Angela. How are you going? Hi, Nick. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Uh, Angela, you are the founder uh, and host of SME TV and Podcasts. Uh, you're a small business champion. You're a business uh, investor. Uh, you're the spokesperson for the SME Association. Uh, you are, of course, uh, a, a sitting councillor on the um, Sydney uh, Sydney City Council, uh, City of Sydney Council, I should say. And uh, I was interested uh, to uh, to pick up here. You've you've uh, held a role as the deputy chair of economic development and business. So I guess you are um, you you are a spokesperson for uh, for the uh, for the small business person there, uh, the person on the street, so to speak. Um, before we sort of get into our our subject matter today. Uh, I mean, you wear a lot of hats. So tell us, what, what have you been doing this week? What is it that keeps you busy? Well, look, like most um, business people, I'm constantly trying to keep the finger on the pulse of, of my own personal businesses and, and where they sit in this global pandemic world and what that looks like. I, I, f I feel like, Nick, like lots of business owners, I have too many lawyers on retainers for the messes that get created from others. So I'm, I'm, this week I've been trying to concentrate on my business but also uh, unfortunately fielding a lot of terrible and very sad calls from local small business owners who are at their wits end and don't know if they'll ever survive out of this pandemic and I've been looking at the data. So so, so t tell me something. Well, you've been looking at the data so let, let's just dive into that um, just, just quickly. I mean, you... You know, there's new announcements today. Uh, you know, this morning I was able to do my personal training because we were outside. Uh, there's four of us that train with my trainer uh, and that was okay, but that's over now. We, we can't do that because that's more than 10 kilometres away from my home. Uh, it's only one-on-one -on -one now. In my personal trainer, if he's watching this now, he, he's absolutely fuming. It's his livelihood. So, so tell me about the data. So the, the data, unfortunately, isn't good. Uh, in the last 18 months, American Express has got this solid data on the additional debt that's been created for small businesses. So in the last 18 months, the additional debt sits at between $100,000 to $300,000 that they've accumulated in the last 18 months. They project that that's going to be an additional 50% of that in within the next year. So anyone could be looking at having shouldering something like half a million dollars worth of burden in debt because of COVID. You, you don't get yourself out from under that, Nick. A lot of them wouldn't even have an investment worth that. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, I've got to be careful because we're an apolitical program here, so I've got to try and uh, try and keep it, uh, what, what's the word, um, uh, ec not ecumenical, uh, broad church type of stuff. Yeah. But and, it's, and it's not about uh, any political... No. Party. This is we're just we're talking numbers, yeah, and data. But 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 as we were chatting just before we started, you know, you, you've just told me that it, it's bad enough for the small business owner that you know they've they've, they've gone from having a certain level of income to, to now right. a lot of them are, it is a hand to mouth existence. But even when this pandemic is over, let's say you just you know click a finger and this thing's over now, they've still got you know all this extra debt. To, to jump over. Now, you're talking about American Express, which is obviously dealing at the retail level. 
Um, but you know, once you once you get out into the, in, you know, I mean, away from the the immediate surrounds of the CBD and into your Surrey Hillses and your Waterloo's and and those sort of more industrial areas, you know, they, they they're going to be uh, looking at numbers much higher than that, and they're they're, they're burdened with that immediately immediately afterwards. So that's, that's right. There is, I I it is a conversation that needs to be had. I think people have been avoiding it. For, for various reasons. It doesn't play out well in the press. Everyone is, you know, shocked when I start talking about this data. But that's, what's hap that's what happens when you have a bad investment, when something goes wrong with where you've put your money and it collapses, you lose that. That's exactly what's happening here with the pandemic, except it's not a matter of it's just a bad investment. Small business owners and, and businesses in general haven't been able to quite draw a line and say, right, that's collapsed, move on and, and cap the loss because they've been told keep going or lockdown open, lockdown open, or they've got a commercial lease in place, they can't actually draw a line under this loss and walk away. So that debt is growing exponentially every single day. And the way we tie that back in having a look at data and saying, you know, is, is this just information that is emotional input? Are we overstating the fact? Okay, no. We know that because of the foot traffic numbers. We know that the sales are down at least 50% pre-COVID. Foot traffic is down even more than that. So right now in Sydney, in the CBD, foot traffic stands at 2%. You tell me, Nick, what are the sales if there's only 2% of foot traffic happening? Well, well, you, well, you know what, Angela? It's that's the foot traffic. So the immediate, the immediate thing is you see the, um, the 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 coffee shop, for example, and and look, I mean, in Sydney we've been lucky, but you know, yes. our luck's obviously changing. You, you know, I've, I went to Melbourne before I wasn't allowed to go to Melbourne. You know, there are shops that are. You know, I, I, I normally stay uh, opposite Flinders Street Station. There's a little laneway there with all the lovely cafes. Half of them seem to be gone, but I noticed in the in the in the notices the other day there was an almond milk manufacturer that was that was declaring protection under the new small business protection and when i looked them up i was curious to look and they seem to be the they i could be completely wrong here but they seem to be the ones that make the almond milk for the cafes you know when you go to the cafe and you have your well you would know um you know you have your little almond milk cappuccino it's not the almond milk you know it's not soy good from around the corner it's this sort of fancy stuff and i thought of course i mean you know these guys so it's not just the the, the cafe it's it's their suppliers, it's their landlords. It goes, it's it's a much uh, wider reaching problem. The collapse of any economic infrastructure is going to have more than, than one victim. You've, you've got the immediate business owner, you've got their suppliers, and then you've got their stakeholders, and then you've got their personal commitments. Stakeholders are landlords, um, whether they're paying, you know, rent for home or they've got a mortgage, so the bank, You've also got credit cards because I, I promise you that debt is piling up because how else are you paying for things? Mm. You've got family obligations. Who knows what obligations you had before the pandemic, whether you're putting kids through school, you were supporting your own parents or other siblings, or you were trying to get an additional education. You know, all of these financial commitments that you have had pre-pandemic, which you managed and had maybe a little bit of buffer, never anticipating that you were going to have zero income, but never anticipating that it was going to cost you money to turn up for work every day. And that's what I want to highlight, Nick. This is the situation. Imagine any employee that turns up to work and before they even start, they have to pay the boss for the privilege of being there. That's oh. what's happening with the business yeah. owner. They're yeah. not making money. Yeah. Right. We're not talking about a return on investment and, you know, that they want their 10 or 15 percent. We're mm. saying that they're turning up for work, mm. putting the key in the door and reaching into their pocket to put money in the till to pay everybody. And there's none coming in. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's exactly right. And uh, and, and it, you know, having to work from home and we're all in this together and, you know, we're not quite all in it together at the same time. It's one thing to be at home in your pajamas and be online if you're you're working for one of the banks. Actually, I, I had I had lunch the, again before before all this. It might have been a month ago. I had lunch in Parramatta, and it was in one of those uh, in the new area. 
and it was in one of the new restaurants. And the thing was practically empty. And the owner was saying to us, actually, the owner also owns one of the cafes in the CBD, I uh, uh, can't remember, district, something district, uh, you'd probably know it. But uh, he was saying, well, all these buildings here, I think it was the water board or whatever, they're trying to get the staff to come back to two days a week. Um, and that was before we had any whiff of this this uh, this new this outcome. current this current yeah. lockdown. So the 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 words of pivot and hybrid that have mm. been tossed around there as the the new norm uh, are going to have far reaching consequences for any economic ecosystem wherever it is. So yeah. again, pre this lockdown, the data was showing that the new weekend is now four days a week. And the work week is three days a week. So Mondays and Fridays, wherever you are, that foot traffic has come down a further 50% of pre-COVID. And Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday has come down um, 30% pre-COVID. And that's when things were kind of normal before this current lockdown in New South Wales. So this is what the new circumstance looks like, even if we as you said earlier, if we could tomorrow stop the pandemic and go back to normal, it's not going to go back to normal in those big economic ecosystems. Now, I wonder, uh, obviously, you know, you are known as being, uh, you know, a champion of a small business. So, I mean, your phone must ring with people, uh, you know, saying, you know, Angela, what, what am I going to do? I mean, what, what's the mo what, what are the, some of the most common questions that you get? So the biggest, the biggest fear uh, right now is how do I deal with my landlord because they're in an impossible situation. And I get, for the record, I get just as many small landlords calling me and asking me the same thing. Um, so it's a, a double-edged sword here. You've got big landlords who are fed up with the, the whinge, they're saying the whinge of the small business owner. You've got a lease in place. You have to pay your rent it's your problem to go work it out. So the, the biggest calls are how do I survive this pandemic and get my landlord to understand that I, I have no more money. So the landlord has, as you would be aware, Nick, most people, personal guarantees against these leases. So not just a three or six month bank guarantee that you've got against your rent. You've also probably signed a personal guarantee and those are all signed you know, long time pre-pandemic. I mean, if you're in the middle of a 10-year lease, you signed it when things were fabulous, right? So they're asking me a question that can't be answered in any real helpful way because if you have no satisfaction with your landlord, I'm telling everyone, I'm happy to go on the record, you need to sit down and have the tough love conversation with yourself. Is this a business that has to collapse and stop do I have to draw the line and walk away myself and risk bankruptcy or insolvency or whatever terms you can sort out? Or do I stay and keep pouring good money after bad? That's assuming you can draw it from somewhere. So how to get out of how to get out of those situations is number one. And number two is how do I feed my family, believe it or not? Do, do you know, a Angela, I did predict that you, you and I only needed about one or two talking points and we'd come up with enough material for about six hours. I just want to, before I dive into, I want to call, call back some of these things, but uh, I, of course, one of the best pieces of advice you can give anybody is to share, like, or subscribe to this podcast um, so that you don't miss out uh, and your friends uh, don't miss out on some of this great content. But just, Angela, let me ask you, where am I going to begin? Firstly, the thing that did pop into my head is that you've got two constituents there? Uh, I mean, one of your constituents that, that 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 in the Sydney, you know, in the city of Sydney Council, of course, is the little landlords. I mean, there's big landlords, of course, um, but th there is landlords. So, uh, but their interests are necessarily, you know, sometimes are competing with some of your other constituents that are small business people. Correct. Is, is that a fair, fair observation? Yes. Yes, there are smaller investor landlords, whether they're residential or commercial. Um, and, of course, the City of Sydney is one of the most densely populated areas, so they could be both or either. And so, it, like, as I said, it's a double-edged sword. You know, if that small landlord has a larger tenant or another small business owner in it and they were relying on that rent to pay the mortgage or maybe it's their retirement or their super fund 
Now, again, let's examine that, Nick. What if you're looking at two years of not earning any income stream from that property investment and you have a mortgage to pay? And what if your own job is in jeopardy? What what happens then? Yeah, well, uh, of course, this is uh, this is one of those things that, that a lot of people don't consider because they consider that the landlords are, you know, some sort of uh, wealthy class. But of course, that's not the case. I mean, uh, you know, you know, if you sort of follow the, you know, people start off with a job and then they're, you know, certainly in our culture, Angela, I might say that we're encouraged to sort of try and. You know, I own a little bit of property early on, but you're still back. Oh, my dad, still... my dad couldn't wait for me to get into debt. I turned yeah. 18 and I'm sure he was standing there with, with a mortgage paper saying, time for debt. Exactly, exactly. But listen, you, you also, you, you really got into something very sort of, uh, you know, dark and serious there, but we do need to talk about it. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes... Uh, I know in my own business, you know, people come to us because they, they, they want to borrow money and... And, and a lot of our constituency too, by the way, you know, we are the, uh, you know, online and social media home for special situations and workouts. So we talk a lot, you know, we've got a lot of liquidators and lawyers and corporate restructuring people. And often someone will come to someone like me for money or they might go to a corporate restructuring person because they want to restructure the business. But sometimes, of course, as you just said, you've got to look, you know, look into that, you know, and say, do I, should I really be in business at all? Am I, it's, it's no good borrowing an extra half a million bucks if you're going to lose it. Uh, there's just another half a million dollars that you've lost in your own personal wealth. I mean, how do you how do you how do you help them make those decisions? Un unfortunately, Nick, I I tell them that I have been in their position before, and like more most small business owners, we tend to make emotional decisions, right? So we're so invested in our businesses or our work or our investments, and we take it all very personal as a reflection on us. So failure in the business world is personal for us and mm. because I made that decision myself a few years ago without getting different financial advice I poured good money in after bad trying to keep the business afloat hoping that something would change and with me specifically it was being along the light rail route I watched my business die for three years while I tried to pay the rent because I had a huge hefty rent you know that's a, that's Sydney for you you you're paying anywhere between twelve or twenty-eight thousand dollars a square meter, and you know I sold a house to cover the rent bill because I couldn't have a conversation with my landlord. Mm -hmm. Now I had hoped for a different outcome. If I could sit down with myself five years ago when I made that decision, I would have made a very different decision, Nick. I would not have wanted to sell a home that was my super investment and trade it off for a a dream that never happened. So I'm having those kind of real conversations with people saying, look, here's what I did wrong. I'm not saying that that your decision's going to be wrong, but I am saying that I wish someone had said to me, think about this girlfriend, you're about to trade off bricks and mortar for goodwill that doesn't actually exist anymore. You know, you, you sort of treat a thought there. Sometimes I, I find, uh, you know, there might be someone in the family that's got a bit of money and could theoretically bail out a business that's just not gonna work. Uh, and I I say to them, you know, you might be better off bailing out whether it's your son or your cousin or your distant relative or your friend, bail them out after they've gone broke. Yep. Um, you know, because if you, if you bail them out now, you know, it's it's you know let, let let them go broke and then give them the money to help pick up the pieces and start again, maybe start a new business or whatever it might be. Yes, hundred um, yeah. percent. 100% agree. There is no point staying in a business that is drowning, that you cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel. And, and you have to be objective about this, Nick. This is the, the most difficult part. Sit down with a, with your financial advisors. Sit down with people who aren't invested with their heartstrings in the business. Get them to be very clinical, like a, a serial killer. Put the knife through and say, no, no more. Pack it up move on, start again, because when you start again fresh, your soul sings in a completely different way and it's it, it hasn't got those nightmare memories of something yeah. else. Yeah, um, I just comment, a comment there, get out of the boat during the storm. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Thank you, Peter Ellis, for, uh, for, for that comment. Hopefully you caught Peter. He was, uh, he was our guest last week and uh, he, was, he was excellent. Thanks, Peter, for that. Uh, actually, uh, that I will I will take an opportunity 
to remind people to, uh, if you do want to ask us a question or comment live, uh, we will send you this, the unique lunch money mug. Um, and I would strongly recommend that you take it down to your nearest cafe with a with a mask around your face and ask for them to fill it up uh, with your favourite your favourite beverage. Nick, okay, let I, me comment about your mug. Okay, nice choice yeah. to have the blue inside. Yes, yes. You yes, know why? Which, why is that? Because it never looks dirty. Well, exactly. I was going. I thought you were going to make some sort of reference to a, a lovely Mediterranean blue or something. There. Oh well, uh, yes, it is a lovely Mediterranean blue. But I'm <laughs> just saying that most people get white mugs. And then yeah. civilians never know how to clean them, so they end up looking grotty inside. Right, 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 right. Or lesser siblings sometimes don't know how to clean them. Ah, uh, yes. Clean them either. Um, all right. Listen, let's um, let's let's take this conversation. We we we've, we've sort of visited the the dark side, but uh, actually, before we move on, Peter Ellis has just made this comment as well. You can always get a new one once the storm has calmed. The boat there, I think he's he's talking about. Thanks, Peter. And 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 on the, on that note, though, pe Nick, people don't believe that there is a different path to travel they think yeah. they're already on that one path and oh you, you know it, I'll, I'll never get another business like this one and i can't let go trust me i'm the queen of not letting go of a business and i'm telling you you can and you yeah. can get another one or do something completely different which you know I, I did i mean you're never too old to start again well that is that is uh, fantastic advice actually that is you, you do need to encourage people I think Ray Kroc started at the age of 52 I used to think that was inspirational until I have well and truly moved past the age of 52 I need a sort of a, I need to find myself a, someone in their 60s or 70s to inspire me but um, he's a new 30 that's a new 30 yeah sure okay so now obviously uh you know, people call. You know, you are a, you're a you're a small business champion, and uh, you're on the you're on the on the council. But you also are the founder and host of SME TV. So I'm interested in that for a couple of things. First, I'm interested in 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 you telling us a bit about that. But I'm also interested in uh, you know we live in this new world. I mean, for example, right now we're on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, and LinkedIn, right? So. Uh, you know, we're not on Channel Nine. We're not on Sky News. Uh, we so we are. Um, going around, you know, playing down the blind side, whatever metaphor you want to give. Uh, and, you know, you, you, you know, some people can reach an awful lot of people this way. So I assume that's that's sort of what you're delivering, that capability to small businesses. Tell us about that. Yeah, so, you know, I've been, as you've said, I, I wear lots of hats and I've been very fortunate to have been exposed to to a lot of media and and use that, um, I think, to my advantage over the years in, in my different roles. And the one thing that kept coming up constantly is that there just isn't enough available media for most SMEs to have a nice, a good crack at being able to present or promote their brand and amplify themselves online. Um, digital has taken that away from mainstream. It's a much cheaper investment now, but still, you know, 30 seconds on a segment on mainstream TV is not going to change your life. But having content that is a much longer piece that you can use in perpetuity, that can stand evergreen, that can be used in multiple ways to promote and amplify your brand and get your message out there, that's of, of great need. So while everyone, Nick, can make content, not everyone can distribute it effectively. And that that becomes the difference in what platforms can offer. Right. Okay. So, so because I know obviously uh, you help people create content and to present themselves in the best light, but also on the distribution side as well. Yes, and that's that's where it is. It's always in in completing the loop, in yeah. executing the end goal. That's where most people fall down. So I think I think what we bring to the table in a difference, a point of difference is that we are a business and I am a business owner and I understand what return on investment means. We're not trying to sell you a dream. We're saying that if you want to promote yourself, your business, your brand, your product, there has to be a, a loop and a circle that comes around and takes into account everything and that includes, great, you've made this wonderful piece of content what are you going to do with it now? And if you yeah. want more customers, then let's go get you more customers. If you just want more eyeballs, let's get you more eyeballs. But let's tailor make it for that reason. 
Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you do need to have an objective in this yeah. stuff, uh, I suppose. Tell me, um, you know, we... You know, we are in the new world. I really don't like talking about COVID or new world or new normal, all that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, the reality is that, that I, well, as a matter of fact, you know, the reason that we, we started Lunch Money was, you know, I, I used to be on, a, on an aeroplane, you know, every week I'd be flying to Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth, whatever, and getting in front of people. Uh, obviously, you know, very limited capability in doing that, particularly right at the moment. So, you know, hence uh, we have lunch money. Um, it's a way of, of, of reaching people. I mean, are you finding that, you know, that, that social media, it, it has taken that twist with this, you know, as a new way of reaching people? I mean, how are you finding that in, in SME TV? Yes, so we um, are born of COVID. We uh, came to market, if you might say, uh, two weeks before Sydney went into lockdown or Australia went into lockdown. We just filmed our pilot. We thought everything was going to stop, um, that the whole business model wasn't going to work because of COVID and how would I get back into studio because the business model is built on being a studio product and a studio quality product. And I had to use that word pivot, um, but I spat the dummy and threw my toys out of the cot very quickly, Nick, on pivoting with Zoom um, because it just wasn't for me. I'm happy to do these interviews, but I can't, didn't want to produce like this for my customer and we just went back in studio very quickly. So, But we were born of COVID. It became even more obvious to us that business needed something else for them not just to get them through, to supplement, to overcome, to pivot themselves, to develop another revenue stream themselves, exactly what we were going through. All of our clients are going through it parallel. So we we kind of did it together. I, I, I noticed, because yeah, you, you kind of, you're doing two things really. I mean, well, lots of things, but one thing is you're providing a platform for small businesses is, uh, is, is, is one thing, um, but you're also providing content for small businesses to consume, obviously. Is like, so how, how do you balance that? How, how, do you, how do you decide? Because I notice you've got different, different segments as well. You've got your, you know, when I go to SME TV, there's the brew, is it? And uh, Yep. We've got different segments, different shows, but they yeah. all, it, it all comes back to, you know, what our message is, which is, you know, informing and inspiring uh, and helping create and promoting. So often sometimes the segments are about news or we're pulling apart what's actually going on and we often get in experts to talk about like what we've just talked about, what's the financial reality of businesses and, and how they can fix or overcome or invest and create because people are in business to create wealth as well. You know, we, we love the sole, the sole part of, you know, I, I love my job and I, oh. I want to be in business, but I'm, I'm there to make money and I've never been ashamed to say that. Um, yeah. I think you're silly if you have another view. Mm. I think it's a hobby outside of that unless you inherit. It's different yeah. or win. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, that, so that's what we try to do. I walked a very fine line early on thinking that people weren't going to be interested in my opinion so I tried to be very objective mm. um, and I was worried about that initially because I am mm. politically motivated and mm. I, I'm careful about walking that line when I'm producing content myself. But turns out the audience speaks mm. um, and their opinion is they want my opinion. So I give it. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, opinions are always a lot more interesting, of course, aren't they? You know, I, again, you know, I... I I, my role is just to let my guests speak. Uh, most people don't necessarily want my opinion, but uh, but but opinions are a lot a lot more interesting, a lot more engaging, even if you agree or you disagree. I, I suppose, um, and yeah, okay, and and so you, I mean, you've, yeah, so you've sort of got it's like a channel with different programs on it, isn't it? Yep. it is the way it, the way it works. Different, and I notice you've got version. some stuff. Yeah, and you've got some stuff in the studio, and your studio looks fantastic. But then uh, I watched one the other day where you were in the field in the in the back of a coffee van uh, with the the blind chap. That was that was yep. quite fascinating, actually. He was, uh, yeah, he was. He was, he's he was always a, a, a sports person, wasn't he? Uh, he's a he's a um, ultra marathon swimmer. Wow! Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Just he he is a great example of inspiring people. And I know as a business owner that you have days where you wake up in the morning and you think, what the truck? 
am yeah. I doing? And for 10 cents, you'd gladly, you know, hand it over. And to talk to someone, um, it's not just enough for me to sit here and say to people out there, you know, be strong, stay safe, be well, it'll all look good in the morning. I find that that's platitudes and it's placating people. I present mm. people of true inspiration and I'm saying to you, look, James is blind. He's never seen his daughter or his wife mm. Mm. and he jumps into water and swims not actually knowing where he's going. Mm. 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 If if that's not the life the daily life of a small business owner, I don't, I don't know what is. And I well, that's in- true. But I mean, the rest of us are just weak compared to that, aren't we? I mean, who well, can? Who can oh, that's just insane. It's fantastic. He, he came to the meeting and to to film and have the interview, and he walked six blocks from his office to the cafe, and he just approached someone in the street randomly and said, "Look, I'm trying to get up to George Street at this place. Can you help me?" And a random stranger took his arm and brought him to the cafe. He has this extraordinary ability to trust and have faith in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, there's so much we're talking about. I I love your approach to small business. I mean, you're very pragmatic. As you say, you're not into the platitudes, all of this stuff of... uh, you know, follow your passion and all that sort of stuff. I believe, you know, follow your passion. At the end of the day, if it's not, you know, if it's not putting money in the bank, you know, you know, giving you wealth, creating your retirement or whatever it might be, depending on your stage in life, then uh, it is just a hobby, really. And in fact, I think the definition of indulgence is uh, doing something for pleasure that's actually, you know, just you know, stopping you from doing you what what you should be doing, you know, or or you know, so so there there is that. I mean, for me, uh, you know, small business is is about personal freedom as well. I think I think that that the measure of how free a society is is how the small business sector thrives. It's not just yes, we're the engine room of the economy and all that sort of stuff, but it is really all about uh, you know the, the ultimate personal freedom is to swing the bat and have a go. But, I mean, how do you have those tough conversations with people? I mean, there must be times you're quite happy to look someone in the eye and say you're having yourself on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think that's I think that's my job is to yeah. be real. The same way I pr- approach things politically when people come to me and say I've got this problem locally or or even bigger than that, you know, I've, I've helped small businesses right throughout New South Wales and Australia, not just locally where I'm I'm elected. And sometimes you hear stories and information from them and you know they've been ripped off and you know they're in the right. You know that you need to seek justice on their behalf. I also know that I can't always get justice for them, but they deserve me to have a go for them. Mm-hmm. On the yeah. other side of that, of course, there's the reality of me saying to someone, it's never going to happen, mm-hmm. stop yeah. flogging a dead horse, let's look at what are our options here? And that's the kindest thing I think you can actually do for someone is to help them understand and arrive at them being able to make better choices. You know, there's there's choices in business every day, Nick. Yeah, yeah. I've just, I know that now this might be a, a tough question to answer, but uh, Peter Ellis is dead keen on getting himself one of our uh, blue lunch money mugs. He asks, is it possible to prepare and present a new business paradigm for small businesses being it, it is okay to walk away until the sun comes out? I, it, it's, it's not a new paradigm. Yeah, it's, okay. It's what, it's what good financial business management has always been about. You know, you don't, the, the sun doesn't always shine on business. Forget about COVID, right? Yeah. Forget about that. Go back to the GFC. Go back to every other instance. I mean, my most profitable business was at a time when interest rates were 18%. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. You yeah, know, yeah. you can borrow money now for 1.84% for your house. Oh, so that is insane, but that's another problem for investors. Do you know it's interesting what hear, hearing what you're saying and sort of answering Peter's question as well. Yeah. I, about about two years ago, I went fishing with my son up on the central coast, and because I'm absolutely a useless fisherman, uh, unbelievable for my for my last surname. But um, we 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 had this kid. He was about 15, and I paid him, slung him some money, and he came out and he drove the boat. It was just a little dinghy, and we go to a spot. He chucked the line in. 
And five minutes, it seemed like two minutes, the fish aren't biting, right, we're out of here. And we were just, it wasn't like a, a schmuck like me would sit there for an hour going, oh, maybe I'm using the wrong bait. I'm not putting, he was like, the fish aren't biting. We're, we're out. We're going over to that spot under the bridge. They're not biting here. And it's a little bit like that too, isn't it? You know, if it's if they're not biting, cut your losses and uh, and move on. Uh, well, it, to, it, to answer Peter's question, I think where small business goes wrong here and they can take a leaf out of bigger organisations where, you know, the the corporate structure doesn't have the owner necessarily at the top, they're a stakeholder but not running the organisation, where you need to wear a different hat. My approach to being in business my whole life has not been as the business owner. I'm an employee of my business just like everyone else and it's my job to be profitable, to be financially responsible, to keep my people safe. So if something isn't working financially, I'm obligated to the business and to the other stakeholders to make those decisions to either get out, change it, cut back, or something like that. So so Peter's right. We mm. need to have a new approach, and it can't be about, you know, this definition of, oh, that's a reflection on me. It's not. It's a reflection of the environment that your business is in right now. Maybe it's your fault. You haven't run it well. That's fine. But make a right decision now. Do you know, I would love to talk to you about... Um the you know it, it it's one thing if you can have that conversation with yourself but i'd love to talk to you about the role of external advisors and, and those sort of informal boards but i do try and put a time time cap on uh, of, 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 and we've sort of hit that time cap i am going to ask you just to give me some closing thoughts i think business need you know we we always get told try and find opportunities um, wherever you are and try and find strengths in, in the weaknesses that are around. So I would say that this is unfortunately an ideal time to reflect in what you want from life and use this time to make sure that that's reflected in your work and your business. Don't think that these are isolated decisions right now. You're not making them just on where you are today. You're making them on where you want to be tomorrow and further down the track. So take that on board when you do view those decisions, whether it's business or something else. And I'd be remiss in, in not pointing out that there is an election coming up in September, Nick. It's a local government election for everyone in New South Wales. Choose your leadership at a local level wisely. Well, uh, I, I, as I said, I think that, uh, you know, small business is not just job creation. I think it's uh, it's just the marker of a free society. Uh, and, and so, so, uh, so, yep, I, I fully concur. Listen, I'm going to try and just get you to help me introduce our, our show of next week by saying, looking at your um, looking at your LinkedIn profile here, you you caught your first shoplifter at the age of three. Yep. Um, so I'm just going to say that next week we've got Wayne Gilbert, who is an ex-copper uh, and he's principal of integrity services at PKF. And we're going to be talking about fraud and crimes and misdemeanors. So uh, you, you've got to tell us, how did you catch a shoplifter at the age of three? You've got to tell us. Uh, with, a, with a broom and there were three oh, of them. <laughs> I, knew, I knew they were stealing, so it was easy. I, I didn't feel outnumbered and I never have. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, Angela Vilfarkas, it's been an absolute privilege to have you on. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your, your wisdom and your thoughts and your opinions. Thank you. Okay, cheers. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and thank you, everybody, who's uh, listened uh, listening subsequently on the podcast. Cheers.